I'm happy to be with all of you this evening. It is a treat. I want to talk to you about the importance of inheritance as related to gender because I have realized it has had deep influence on my own culture as a Westerner and a very deep influence on South Asia where I work. And some of you will know as I talk that it may be true in places where you are or people that you know in your area. So I'll be interested to hear from you later, from some of you, as to whether this is relevant for your place as well. Let's start with the story. Vanya married Manoha in India. They went to live in Mumbai. Um, they were in an apartment, his parents' apartment. Mumbai is very expensive to live. Probably the apartments there cost as much as here. And the parents decided, why get another apartment for our son and his wife? The son is a, F, is a pilot. He's away several nights a week. We won't get another apartment. So there was one bedroom. The parents had the bedroom. Christians and Malahar and Vanya had a sofa in the sitting room when he was there. When he was away flying, Vanya served his mother. She didn't think that was good enough. He was a pilot. He did have a good salary. But no. He was not willing to disobey his mother and go and move out into an apartment of their own. She pleaded no change. She went to the pastor. He was afraid to discuss a family matter. After six months, Vanya went home. There are a lot of issues inside that story. Controlled by the parents, the fact that the son was willing to obey his parents, the fact that what was the very view of marriage? I want us to think about the view of marriage there. Because in that family's thinking, the important thing was that Manoha should marry and his wife should give birth to a son. His wife didn't matter very much. The important thing was that she should give birth to a son. And she could be voiceless. It did not matter. I want to talk about the word patrilineal, the thinking, patrilineal worldview. It's a bit like patriarchal, but it's at the back of patriarchal sometimes. Just briefly, we could say patriarchal means control of the family by the males. The patrilineal worldview is the family culture in favor of the male line for genealogy, inheritance of assets and property, for status, family control, and future significance. And often the patrilineal view drives the patriarchal view. And that's something I want to say more about. <coughs> Women told me just last year, they were the wives of some of the students at our theological college. Their mothers brought them up saying, don't laugh. Don't laugh, you're a girl. And when you go to your mother-in-law's house, don't laugh, don't have too many opinions, you would bring dishonor on our family. I was sad. What kind of inheritance is that from a mother? Girls are there to do what their family tells them. My friend Smitha, who is about 30 and not yet married, I'm not sure she will marry, she said, my aunties brought me up to believe that my main task when I married would be to provide sexual services for my husband and to look after his family. And if I did that, that would, they would feel honored. I would not have brought dishonor on the family if I did those two things when I went to my husband's home. <coughs> But this control of the family, importance to the family line, is there all the way through the Old Testament. I'm sure many of you have thought about it. 
We've got to think about it because we care what is in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Even by Genesis chapter 5, when they wanted to say who was descended from who, they gave the male line. You can think about Abraham. <clears throat> Much of the story of Abraham depends on whether he had a son or not. He was so aggravated about it. It actually destroyed his relationship with his wife so that they didn't think it mattered if he took a servant as a concubine. God was going to use Abraham and Sarah, but they were so concerned about it that they couldn't think about their own relationship and it actually damaged their relationship with each other and with God. They were so concerned to have a son. <coughs> Excuse me. And the same thing is true of Isaac wanting a son, Jacob, David, Solomon. The important thing was a son. Here are some of the negative characteristics of the patrilineal thinking. It prevented the bonding of husband and wife, as it shows in the relationship between Rebecca and Isaac. Their marriage started well, they were in love. But who received the money, who received the inheritance was actually what split them as a husband and wife. It causes damage to the marriage. The patrilineal thinking focused on fertility. And you'll be aware how they thought a barren woman was cursed since she had no reason to be alive if she could not produce a son. It favoured sons and especially eldest sons. And think how David's father, Jesse, when Samuel came to the family, brought David's older brothers and never thought that God might have a plan for the younger brother. It caused marital inequality. Senior men and husbands were expected to make decisions and wives did not have the same rank because they could not be part of the decision making. They were treated as lesser persons. It supported polygamy. God planned monogamy, but humans were greedy for more children, more wealth that they could get through children, and chose to have more wives. Example is Jacob. The leveret marriage was part of the patrilineal worldview. The brother of a deceased man with no children had to marry the widow for offspring. It was not so that someone would look after the widow. It was, as the verse there says, oh. go back one, yeah, sorry. There we are. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother. That was the reason for the leveret marriage. God also seemed to say that this was the thing to do. Maybe God's plan was support for that widow. But in their thinking, it was to carry on the name. And then this patrilineal worldview causes families to require obedience. Children of parents and wives of husbands, um, like the feudal system. And in India, the system was very like the feudal system. It was called the Zaminda system. It also required obedience. Well, what is that cultural worldview? It prevented wives and husbands being considered as a new family. When they married, they, the wife was simply joining her husband's family. Well, what was God's view of this patrilineal thinking which is all through the Old Testament? That's an important question. God was not stuck on this view that the eldest son 
had to receive all the importance and all the inheritance. Who did God choose out of Cain and Abel? Abel. Who did God choose out of Isaac and Esau? Isaac. David, more important than his brothers. The three siblings, Moses and Aaron and Miriam, were all chosen. They were all leaders. Deborah and her husband Lapidoth, God chose Deborah, even though she had a husband, to be the one who was the leader. Similarly with Huldah, whose husband's name was Shalom. God did not care about this human view that the important person was the oldest son. God was choosing whom he would choose. I think we need to notice that because we feel as we read the Old Testament as if this was what God wants. But I think we need to notice God had other plans. Well, what about the New Testament? <clears throat> Here God included, God ignored, male, oh, the early church ignored the male privilege. Women were included as church leaders, and you all know this, Mary, the mother of John, Mark, Phoebe, Lydia, Philip's daughters, God chose them. God was not depending only on eldest sons. And in fact, we can say, God did not care about the patrilineal worldview that the Old Testament was emphasizing all the way through those centuries. It was not part of what God was doing. God ignored it. In a nutshell, God did not agree with the patrilineal culture. What was God's idea of family? God's family is made up of those who have put their faith in Christ. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of the husband's will, but born of God. That's the family God was looking for. Not the human family which the people of Israel were yearning for and working for. Paul said, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. You who belong to Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And there are three or four more verses about those who believe in Jesus being heirs of God. This patrilineal line that had to have a male son and heir to receive the property and the prestige was not part of the thinking of Jesus or Paul. What was the family modeling in the New Testament? Couples made decisions independently. Think about Elizabeth and Zechariah. Think about Mary and Joseph after they were married, before they were married. Mary even made a vital decision without asking her parents or her husband to be his parents. And after they were married, they decided they had to go down to Egypt. They decided when they came back when the angel told them to. They were not taking orders from his parents. That is different from the South Asian culture and many other cultures. This control by family members and giving inheritance to eldest sons was the background of Western thinking too. Even in, I, my ancestors came from Britain, some of you know the story by Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. It came out as a movie. There were five daughters and their mother, and who was receiving the property? A male cousin. And none of those girls or their mother thought that this was wrong. Or well, if they did, they thought they could not do anything about it. And the cousin thought it was right for him to receive the property. That was in Western culture until recent years. Some people tell me in their community it is still in Western culture. <coughs> the family modeling then in the New Testament um, 
By not marrying, Christ refused the patrilineal or culture for himself. In South Asia, a young man and a, nun, and a young woman are usually required to get married. If a girl says she doesn't want to get married, her parents don't want to listen to her. I've been in a prayer meeting of a group where my friend said to me, please pray for my brother. He's 34 and he's not doing his duty in getting married. We've got to do something about it. <clears throat> Christ respected those who chose to be childless and Paul himself was single and wished this for others. And then the New Testament family teaching. <clears throat> Jesus' goal was all the earth entering God's family. It was not about trying to get their family tree, their family line into a dominant position. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It was more about behavior than descent. Women were included as heirs. Notice this in the Gospels. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That was not said only to men. That was said to men and women. Jesus expected that men and women were both inheriting. And similarly in Paul's writing, his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Two or three more verses like that. In Peter's writing, husbands must view their wives as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. And I have to teach this when I'm in India that therefore women can inherit. If they can inherit in God's kingdom, if that's good enough to inherit from God, then surely they can inherit from their own mother and father. It's changing in India. Some families have changed, but it's a slow process. Summary so far, for hundreds of years, Jews were off course about family. It wasn't really what God wanted. Jews wanted believers, Jesus wanted believers to stop being fixated on money, property, and inheritance. Remember, one man came to Jesus and asked Jesus to intervene between him and his brother over inheritance, and Jesus would not get involved. It was not what he was worried about. Sisters and brothers are expected to inherit in the same way. And justice will give equal value to women and men. Patrilineal family culture today. I'm going to quote from some Indian writers here so that you don't think that I am as a Westerner trying to criticize Indian culture. So I'm going to quote Indian writers here. Life for a woman in a joint family is a grim struggle. It demands a lot of adjustment and sacrifice. <clears throat> a woman is defined primarily in relation to her husband and her household where she belongs. A woman who has not got a father or not got a husband is considered a nothing and a nobody. An ideal woman is one who is, look at this, submissive, dutiful, loyal, and totally devoted to her husband. That's the person that they wish to praise. This is written by two male theologians. For the most part, however, the moral demands of wedded life, namely for faithfulness, loyalty, obedience, and service, are made more on the wife than on the husband, thus setting separate standards of morality, one for man and another for woman. 
Here's a case story. I was teaching a, a course in Christian writing and Marlene wrote me a short article that had happened to her just the previous week. Her daughter, who was 10, was learning piano and the teacher had arranged the first little piano recital for her pupils. And so Marlene's daughter had played her first little ditty on the piano and Marlene, like a, like a good mother, was so proud of her daughter being able to start learning to play the piano and play it nicely for people to enjoy. But she said in her article that she wrote, I sat there with tears in my eyes because as my daughter played the piano for people to enjoy, I thought how ten and a half years ago my husband told me to get an abortion. My husband's mother told me to get an abortion because we had had a um, scan done and they told me it was a girl. I didn't know what to do, she said. I'm told as a Christian I must obey my husband. I'm told I must obey his mother. But I did not want to abort my baby daughter. And I never went for it. I felt bad. I was disobeying my husband. I was disobeying his mother. But I'm so happy now because if I had not kept that baby, this beautiful little girl who's playing the piano would have been a pile of ashes. That's one of the results of the patrilineal worldview. Girls are not needed, except that you've got to bring them into the family to get your husband married, you get your son married, so he will have a son. <coughs> In the patrilineal worldview, women and girls have as their reason for living to marry and produce sons for their husband's family. Daughters are temporary members in their birth family, and when they leave their birth family, when they get married, they become conditional members in the marital family. There's a, a wording in the ancient laws of Manu. Let a girl be born, but let her be born in somebody else's family. And a popular saying, educating a girl is like watering your neighbor's garden. Because you don't need, you're not going to get the benefit of her education. I've got a chart here which illustrates that patrilineal view of family. Now let me say again, this is changing, but it's still very strong. In the middle, the real family. The grandfather, father, son, grandson. Now, a wife is brought in for grandfather. The wife comes into the family from the left-hand side there, comes into the family. If she gives birth to a son, he goes down the next step, remains in the family. If she gives birth to a daughter, the daughter is sent out the other side when she marries. Next generation, the same. A daughter brought in for the son. If she gives birth to a, to a son, that one stays in the family. If she gives birth to a daughter, they'll raise her and then send her out and daughters are told, you are not a real member of this family. You're going to go to another family. You're going to benefit another family. I've asked some Indian people how it felt to belong to a family like that. And those who had come in as wives to a new family, this one is missing from the um, PowerPoint, the wives said they feel outsiders, blamed pressurized and helpless, praying urgently for a son. If they're Hindu, they're praying for a son. If they're Christian, they're praying for a son. How do the daughters feel? Inferior, rejected, lack of identity, lack of self-esteem. They feel forced always to adjust and sometimes they feel rebellious. Fathers and sons may feel this is what men and women told me, proud, privileged. 
indifferent to the wishes of wives and daughters, and careless of other feelings. Because that's how their mothers have brought them up. What kind of husbands are they going to make? And most pastors and social leaders are afraid to discuss this and they do not see it as a problem. And they say, we must not interfere with the home. These relationships are sacred. Within the home, the real family then on that chart was grandfather, father, son, grandson. Inside that family, obedience is required. The saying of the village women, your husband is your God. That's serious, isn't it? And even in the village women's songs, a young woman must never return to her birth home even if her state is woeful. Her husband is her God. If a young woman had a bad time in her marital home, if she was ill-treated, she normally will not go back to her family for fear that they will feel so much loss of honour that they would rather not have her. If she has a sister who is not yet married, she can't go back because there will be so much loss of honour for her family that the family will not be able to get her sister married. And I've heard reports even of Indian girls living in America whose husband is treating them badly when they've come here and they do not even tell their mother and father or their sisters back in India because of the shame that would bring on their family. And another statement they make, there are no castes, there are only two castes male and female. Now you know, the, have heard of the caste system in India with Brahmins at the top and scheduled castes at the bottom. These village women say there is more difference between the life of a man and a woman, that's the real caste, than between Brahmin and scheduled caste. It's not the men's view, they think the big difference is there. The women can see there's more difference between men and women because the men get to make the decisions and the women do as they're told in the way that the caste system does the Brahmins make the decisions and the ones at the bottom get to do as they're told. It appears also in the uh, media <coughs> in the films Modern media reinforce the age-old views. Women are often in the media, in the films, possessive. They put up with hardship. They seek the family honour. That's how they're supposed to be. And they must not question their husband or his parents. And many of the Hindi movies have as their main point, is this young man going to obey his mother or his wife? And the whole point of the movie might be, is he going to obey his mother or his wife? When he obeys his mother, they heave a sigh of relief, he's done the right thing. Christian men have said to me, I feel like a table tennis ball between my mother and my wife. She tells me what to do, she tells me what to do, and I don't know what to do. It's not easy for the men either. And it's all come from this patrilineal worldview that men are more important, sons are more important, and that mothers bring up their sons to believe that. Let's move on. Reasons for marrying. I can ask a group of Christians at the college where I work, What's the chief biblical reason for marrying? And some of them can say companionship and back it up with, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. <coughs> then I ask, what are some of the common reasons for getting married here? And they will tell me, to please parents. 
because he or she may become old. To obtain dowry, money and goods from the young woman's family. Dowry used to be a way of sending a young woman to her husband's home with a little nest egg of some kind for hard times. These days, dowry is given to the parents of the young man. The girl doesn't see it. The couple often don't see it. And sometimes the young man's family have debts they want to pay, so they get their son married so they can get the dowry and pay their debts. To get the daughter settled with financial security, to have sex, to have a son to inherit, and for a kind of insurance for old age, because the son is going to be earning and providing for his parents. And to bring home a girl to work for his parents. What do you think about that list of reasons for getting married? Any one of them is considered enough, even all together. As I see it, there are some moral issues there. The moral issues are things like manipulation of young men or young women, marriage for money, that's not what marriage is about, control from one generation to the next, forced service and obedience by young wives, and anyway, how fair is it to demand she gives birth to a son? And what about respect, mutual love and mutual self-sacrifice between husband and wife? That patrilineal system is destructive to the husband-wife relationship. All right, I was describing South Asia, but some of these things come into Western culture too. Even in Western, school teach in Western cultures, many school teachers give more attention to the boys in their classroom than the girls. They have tested it out, had somebody sitting there counting the amount of time spent listening to the questions from the boys and the questions from the girls in a classroom. And many teachers, women or men, will give more attention to the boys. And families may assist their son with more financial help than their daughter. And related to it is the sexual harassment at work in social life and on the street because you know as well as I do, mothers often favour sons and make sons grow up thinking that life will be okay for them more than for their sisters. Or easy for them and they'll get what they want. <coughs> Here we are, patriarchy and patrilineal thinking work in tandem, work together to favour boys over girls. Women maintain the male line and oppression of females is often carried out by women. And this is not <clears throat> always recognised. People suppose that when they run aid and development projects, that women will help women, and that women will help their daughters to get ahead in life. Some women will receive, say, a goat from the project and they're supposed to get it to have, um, they might be going to milk it and get more goats and they'll sell the baby goats. What will they do? Send their son to school and not their daughter. So the project is trying to help women and missing out. Last year, friends who were doing development in Nepal told me they were giving a cow to some families. And when they came after 18 months to assess their work, something showed up that they had not expected. Because they now had a cow to look after, they needed somebody to look after it. They kept their daughter home from school to look after the cow. And the whole thing that they were trying to do, helping families, was disadvantaging girls. Because that's the kind of decision a family makes when they feel that the daughter's education does not matter because she's not staying in their family. Let me tell
tell you some of the things that happen inside families. Many of them cannot be uh, monitored, and therefore you cannot make laws of the country about them. The female fetus is often aborted. They think in India more than two million female fetuses are aborted every year and almost no male fetuses. And the disproportion in the population of India is getting increasingly serious. Um, roughly 900 baby girls born for every 1,000 baby boys. In some villages, they say, no baby girls have been born for six or seven years. There's less care, less food, less medical attention for little girls. Boys attend school and girls do not or discontinue before they are even literate. Boys grow up believing males have privileges. The family will demand dowry and harass young wives for more, even when she's been married, been in the family for two or three years, they're still asking for more dowry money in some families. Then there's the physical, emotional, verbal, and sexual abuse. And the last one is that faithful wives, monogamous wives, who've never had sexual relationships with anybody but their husband, get HIV and AIDS. 40% of all the HIV and AIDS cases in India are monogamous wives and the husband's bringing it home. Out of those, 90% will be put out of the family home by their mother-in-law. They'll be blamed for bringing AIDS into the family and they'll be put out even though it was the son of the mother-in-law who brought AIDS into the house. Those things, those decisions are getting made inside the four walls. And when I think about how well-meaning feminism has come to India and tried to raise the status of women, I think that people have often missed. It has changed. Things have changed a lot for women. But they've missed the fact that women are carrying out a lot of the discrimination, maybe more than 50%. I've discussed this with some of my students. Maybe 50 or 60% of the discrimination against females is carried out by females. Why? Because that older woman will be better off when she gets older, she thinks, if her son gets more money and looks after her. So she doesn't care about her daughters. So it's actually very selfish. I get some surprised looks from men in India when I'm saying that the problem is often caused by women. <clears throat> Have we got theology to answer this? We've already seen the patrilineal thinking in the Old Testament, but we've attempted to counter it. Have we got anything else? Yes. Each marriage starts a new family. A young couple are a new family. Let's look at the diagrams. <clears throat> In the patrilineal or traditional worldview, and this is Hindu and Muslim, and I think it's the same thing in China, where they are aborting a lot of female fetuses also because the sons are more important. And I'm told other parts of the world also If the wife's family and the husband's family are each shown as two circles, she has left her family and gone into his family. And that's the end of the story. She no longer can go back to her family. The next one, you could say we, have a, we could aim for a more balanced view, that he moves a little bit and she moves a little bit and then there's be an overlap. But the Bible goes further than that. Look at this diagram of Next one, please. Here we are, figure three. The big circle round is the extended family. Inside, we have husband's family, wife's family. The husband 
leaves his family, the wife leaves her family and they start a new family. If they do that, it does not matter if they look after the wife's parents or the husband's parents. When you're giving gifts at the wedding, you can give them to the young couple to help them set up family. If the young couple give birth to a son or a daughter, they can look after both the son or daughter because they're not saying we need a son because he's going to stay in our family because a daughter or a son would be moving out from that family and starting a new family. The next pick, next, no? Here's our basis. And you know this verse extremely well and it's well known amongst Christians in South Asia but they have struggled to work out what it means in family life. A man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and they shall become one flesh. If you're doing that, you will not have a man saying, I feel like a table tennis ball between my mother and my wife. He would be bonded with his wife. A new family, not controlled by the older family. And that is four times in the Bible. Genesis, Matthew, Mark, and Ephesians. Women are partners with their husbands. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? In God's plan, the couple leave their parents and make their decisions together. Women and men can handle the money. I've picked out several places in the Bible where women are viewed as able to be uh, able to manage money, they have inherited money or they have money in their hands. The wife who bought a field in Proverbs, the Shunammite wife who was wealthy, Lydia ran her own business, Phoebe travelled, Joanna supported the disciples. Much of the belief in the patrilineal thinking is that women cannot manage money. That's why you've got to give it to boys, to men. It's not biblical. Well, what will the new family look like? And it would be fun if we were a smaller group to ask people, what would the new family look like? <clears throat> In fact, that's one of my daughters and her husband. <laughs> the strongest bond will be husband-wife. And nobody disagrees with that. I can, I can teach this in in South Asia and everyone can agree the strongest bond should be husband and wife. Husbands and wives will talk and plan together as equals. That is part of the strong bond but that people find difficult if they think the wife is going to have an opinion or that the husband might disobey his parents. They would together plan for themselves with their children and their money and their jobs. They would be committed to each other first and not to the family line. The pressure and manipulation on adult sons to obey parents or daughters-in-law to obey the husband's family would cease. Brothers and sisters would both inherit equally. The young couple would emotionally leave their parents even if they're living in the same home. Preference for sons would disappear. You wouldn't have to have this problem of abortion of the female fetus. Girls would be respected as daughters or daughters-in-law and welcomed to take part in decisions. Girls would be respected. You wouldn't have to have this funny statement that men want respect and women want love. In the scriptures, it asks for wives to respect their husbands. That's in Ephesians 5. And it asks for husbands to respect their wives in 1 Peter 3 and 7. It's both. Widows would not be deprived of money or support. And one hopes violence against women would decrease. But I want us to think about how this applies 
around the world, sending missionaries to different countries? Are we taking the full gospel if we do not take the gospel of the equality of humans? I think not. And I feel sad that in theological colleges in India, there have been about 200 years of Bible teaching in India. Very few people have seen this need. Very few have observed that the patrilineal family thinking is causing so much damage and so much hurt. I think it's because I'm a woman in a theological college there are some other women in theological colleges, but the number is quite low. I think it's given me a perception that I want to pass on to others. So, what have we learned? Next one. The patrilineal worldview can do great damage. And I think it causes much of the patriarchal thinking as well. Patriarchy is an, a, a thing in its own right as well. But the patrilineal thinking is often behind it. And if we don't observe that fact, it may be that while we are fighting against the problem of patriarchy and not looking what is causing it, that might be one reason for the slow change when we want patriarchy to disappear. It might be that we've not been looking behind to see what was causing it. It is human rules and not God's pattern for families. Perhaps Christians can teach a more just and more God-honouring system for families. And perhaps Christians can work for change in inheritance and in parenting that can lead to other changes and more justice. Has anyone got questions? I'm going to do a uh, Phil Donahue imitation here. <laughs> when I get on a white wig, you know, come out with a... Uh, Okay, just the microphone. Yes. Yes. So is divorce Divorce is um, considered bringing dishonor on your own family and on the family you have married into. And honor is very important. So divorce amongst Hindus has been very low. It's changing. And divorce amongst Christians is also considered bringing great dishonor and it's very low. But that's changing too. I'm not saying we ought to be looking for more divorce, but I would rather teach people respect within the family so that we don't have to say divorce is the last option, is the option. No, I haven't taken that one up. Okay, so I wondered if you had a certain take on that to give us yeah. You spoke a lot about India uh, and your perceptions and, and uh, experience over there. What do you see that might be blind to our eyes in our own Yes, it's very interesting. I have to be careful when I'm teaching in India that people don't think I'm saying Western culture's got it right and you've got it wrong. I have to carefully explain there's a traditional culture which we had earlier in the West and there's what 
might call a pop culture, which has changed so much in the West and is coming into India and other South Asian countries very rapidly. But I have to say, I'm against both of those. I want to look what the Bible has to say. I apologize. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure there is, and it's part of Jesus' teaching. And one of the things I mentioned was that Jesus and Paul chose not to be part of the patrilineal system by not marrying, and that Jesus respected childlessness. I think there is, if we get away from the patril patrilineal thinking, more respect for singleness. I think that it's a little different from South Asia um, because the inheritance laws will not be the, the inheritance customs will not be the same. But I think that it's the huge divisions into thinking that there's a, a, a stereotype way of being a woman and a stereotype way of being a man, which is in the patrilineal culture. And that in this reversion to patriarchy in some Western thinking, it's women must be seen to be passive and that we will hold the marriages together by the women obeying. And you know this group, whether that's going to work. <clears throat> And the Indian take on that is that if a family has two daughters, let's get our son married to that family because then the daughter is going to inherit. Yeah. 